Okay, thanks a lot. Um, yeah, you made my first name a bit uh, German, Karsten, but it's Karst. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> Um, yeah, I think I have a, a couple of challenges for this uh, presentation. The first one, well, Phil did comfort me a bit, saying that uh, Dupuis was also an engineer, talking about appraisal. So <laughs> this is the same for me. I'm also an engineer or a geographer and environmental scientist, talking about economic valuation. So this, I felt that this was a challenging question that I, I got to, um, to give this uh, presentation and also write the paper. And the second one is, of course, I have to keep you awake for this last uh, uh, hour um, in a presentation which is mainly text and not, a, not the nice figure as an illustration that some others uh, had, but I'll do my best. There's also <coughs> somebody asking if, if I would be the one to wrap it all up, but I will leave that to uh, <laughs> the chair to do so. Okay. Um, yeah, I would like to um, briefly talk, um, uh, well, of course, uh, after the introduction on what are the different methods which are, uh, have been used or are in use to, to evaluate um, accessibility. And then I'm going to move on to the limitations and um, conclusions and, and discussion. Yeah, so I think um, one, um, also while I was writing this, uh, this paper, uh, I was thinking, and let's say, on, on literature, on economic valuation, and, and also accessibility valuation. And um, as you know, I've been very active in accessibility analysis in the past, uh, let's say, 10, 15 years. And, uh, the field has developed very rapidly um, with all kinds of new data sources that, that, came, that became available and new techniques and new tools. But I feel that when you look at the economic valuation, we are still looking at the same uh, theories and, 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 and tools that, that were already developed in, in well, 60s, 70s and, and 80s, uh, most of it. And, which, of course, interesting why and should we not develop more? So I will certainly also argue um, that there's a need for more research on this. And also, I think, not only, uh, uh, I mean, practical, but also, I think, theoretical and also, uh, I think, empirical. Um, and the second point is, I think, that even, um, I mean, there, there are already advanced uh, accessibility models which are around already for a long time. I mean, in the 1990s, there were already, I mean, LUTI models developed for a long time uh, since then, but they do not find a way into the, into the, the transport project appraisal practice. Um, so, yeah, even if we have advanced models, uh, apparently we're not using them. Um, yeah, maybe uh, also, let's say, uh, uh, on accessibility, I think, I mean, that has been stated before, so I, I will be brief. Uh, I mean, why, why are we looking at this? Why are we looking at accessibility? Well, this has to do with the role of, of, of transport in society, providing, let's say, people, uh, individuals, firms, op opportunities to participate in, in, in different uh, locations. Um, I will not give you uh, a very elaborate definition. So those who have been um, um, yeah, seeing some of my presentations, th this will, will come as no surprise. So I, I typically distinguish the, between the four components of accessibility and four different perspectives. Um, but I will use this in this, pre in this presentation as sort of a starting point to structure the presentation. Um, so when you look at, let's say, accessibility, uh, of course, uh, many look at um, uh, time, cost, and effort to get from A to B. So this is the transport component. The land use component has been discussed also um, a lot. Um, there's, of course, also there's a temporal component because accessibility varies uh, much um, across the day. Um, also, we have time budgets um, and so on. And there's also an individual component which has also been um, uh, talked about today that people have different needs and abilities and opportunities to, um, to travel. Uh, when, then, then when you look at the different disciplines who have been working on, on accessibility, you see that most of them are focusing on, let's say, one or two or maybe three of those components. And there's not sort of one over overarching comprehensive <laughs> method which is uh, going across these uh, components and also the interactions between, between the components, which would make it quite complex. So um, transport engineers, planners are very much familiar with, let's say, the infrastructure-based perspective, which mainly looking at uh, time and cost. Don't really look at uh, the land use uh, component or, let's say, difference between uh, individuals. Um, urban planners, <coughs> geographers typically focus on the location-based uh, perspective. Um, and you go to time geography, um, this is more focusing on, let's say, person-based um, accessibility and, um, yeah, you could say spatial economists or economic geographers or economists uh, have been focusing on the utility-based um, uh, perspective. 
So if you go to, let's say, um, take that into valuation, um, you will see that each of those perspectives have actually developed tools for um, uh, economic valuation of exitability. Uh, well, Eric already uh, talked a little bit about this, which is good because I don't have to spend a lot of time um, on that. So um, quickly on, on those, um, well, the, I think still, um, although we, we, we have been discussing this for quite a long time, we see the, um, let's say, the um, disadvantages of, of looking at travel time savings and the dis disadvantage of the rule of half is, is still, I think, is dominant in, in, in terms of decision making. Um, and yeah, the assumption, of course, is that uh, all benefits uh, are, let's say, uh, attributed to generalized uh, cost changes in a network. Um, and it's not taking into account, um, let's say, destination utility or, or land use changes, um, because you assume that um, uh, these are not, let's say, within the, uh, the benefit measure. And also, we have to look at marginal changes and not fundamental changes. Um, if you look at from the infrastructure to the location-based perspective, well, Eric already um, talked about this. There are uh, well-established links between different modeling frameworks, the travel demand modeling frameworks, from gravity-based to spatial interaction model to uh, um, uh, random utility models. Um, there have been several benefit measures which have been developed, um, some already quite a long time ago, based on the gravity model or based on the uh, spatial interaction model or the doubly constrained spatial, inter spatial interaction model, which is still heavily used as a transport demand model. Um, I don't want to, to let's say, um, dwell on, on, on the formulas and so on, but I think it's interesting to see that, uh, I mean, Hansen's accessibility-based measure is, is, um, is famous. I mean, looking, let's say, uh, on accessibility um, from the, the gravity point of view, although with a negative exponential function, um, has been around for uh, well, more than 60 years, heavily used. And then if you look at, let's say, the economic valuation of it, already yeah, Neuburger, no, no, uh, or Neuburger, actually how to pronounce it, um, already 1971, which is actually my birth year, um, already uh, developed this measure of consumer surplus from this um, a framework. But if you look at the applications, that, that, that it's, um, there are surprisingly few. Um, the same you could say with the spatial interaction models. So, I mean, this is all, um, I mean, textbook uh, work. Uh, I think the most uh, important one is that uh, in the spatial interaction model, the major constraint is that um, uh, origin destinations are always fixed, um, and so uh, it means that land use does not does not change with with the spatial interaction framework, the, the standard one. Um, but you do look at uh, let's say uh, distribution of uh, of trips. Now, Francesco Martinez already uh, in, in uh, 1990s and all these papers from 2000 developed this uh, benefit measure, um, which is using the spatial interaction model to come up with this uh, measure of, uh, of benefits. He even, let's say, um, overcame the assumption of the, uh, the constraint in, in the uh, spatial interaction modeling framework, allowing locations to, uh, to change. Um, he has shown also with this LUTI model that it is, uh, let's say, uh, accurately measuring uh, accessibility benefits. So, yeah, we already know this for, let's say, 20 years. And then if you look at citations and applications, um, I found 12 citations, actually three of them were mine. So only nine other papers seem to have read or used at least that paper, which I think is quite essential. So the, I mean, spatial interaction models have been used for, for decades and decades. And when you look at economic valuations and using that as a basis for appraisal, only few have done that. So this is, I think, very surprising to me. Same story, uh, you could say, if you look at random utility-based models, so the most well-known is, of course, the, the log sum, the denominator of the uh, multinomial logic model, where Eric also already uh, talked about this, um, which is uh, the advantages are well-known in the literature. I mean, it's an exact measure. Um, uh, it's, uh, I mean, it's, um, it's quite well-known. Um, also, if you apply it within LUTI framework, it does take uh, into account destination utilities. There are many advantages. Still, the number of applications is actually quite uh, few maybe 20 or maybe 30, and most of them published after the year 2000. And when you go to applications or papers in, 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 in let's say, uh, academic literature, and then you, if you go into application into cost-benefit analysis, I think the amount of applications actually are much, much smaller. Um, 
I found one recent uh, paper which did, did describe, let's say, a loxome application in, in tubercus benefit analysis. So again, we know, let's say, uh, some of these more advanced um, methods to, to, to evaluate exhibility, uh, but yeah, it does not sort of trickle down to, uh, to practice. I think if you go to beyond, let's say, the, the trip-based approach into acti activity-based or person-based approaches, this is uh, even more the case. I mean, there have been some uh, academics, um, including Eric, um, going, let's say, developing hybrids between utility-based and, and, and person-based accessibility, uh, where you can derive the benefit, let's say, from uh, performing activities in, in time and space and so on, which is very comprehensive. Um, it goes beyond, let's say, many of the limitations of the trip-based approaches, but um, it's, 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 um, it's not often applied. Although, I, I think also, I think there are not so many or maybe currently no, let's say, person-based or activity-based models which actually uh, are used within a LUTI framework. So um, that, I think, still remains to be a question. So, um, yeah, this was sort of a very brief uh, overview on, on the theory, then to, to the limitations. Um, I think in all of those, there's a question on do they really, let's say, take into account the different components of accessibility and also the interactions between the components of accessibility. So, I'll be talking about that. Um, I think ICT, digitalization, accessibility, is something which is also um, not being mentioned actually today, but I think this is creating more challenges for, uh, for let's say, transport appraisal, also related to, uh, to value of time, I think. Uh, well, equity has been um, uh, mentioned, and I've got also, I think, uh, appraisal framework. So I'll just walk through um, these um, eight points. Um, yeah, so I think um, if you look at the, the land use components, I think the main, um, let's say, I could say common practice is just to ignore it, just to ignore that land use is changing as a result of transport investments, which makes life very easy, of course, um, as let's say from a, a practical perspective. But at the same time, yeah, you don't take into account, let's say, uh, decreasing uh, marginal returns of, of transport investment in longer time when people are changing homes, changing jobs further away, um, and which is at the in the long run, of course, decreasing the benefits from transport investment. So if you don't take this into account, I think you're you're missing um, a big uh, part of the equation. Um, also, some of the studies that we have done actually do show that if you take this into account within the land transport interaction framework, you do find that small changes in location choices uh, resulting from, let's say, investments in, in rail transport or, or road infrastructure actually can have a significant impact on, on accessibility effects um, or benefits, I should say. Um, in this case, this was expressed in, in the LOXOM uh, method. And also, um, if you look at land use policies, you can actually uh, easily derive policies which actually also come up with substantial accessibility benefits, so in monetary terms. Um, compared to uh, investments in, in, in new infrastructure. So it does allow you to, to, to look at a broader range of, uh, of policies. I think there is a, a point that, that um, uh, Eric also um, pointed at, that if you look at spatial interaction models or entropy, entropy models or ran, random util, utility framework, all of those, let's say, uh, transport demand models uh, used for evaluation of accessibility actually focus on actual demand or model demand. So all the benefits, all the accessibility benefits that we derive from those are, are let's say, linked to actual demand. Where have people gone to? Um, also for uh, the logsum, I mean, the only reason to, to, um, to have, let's say, uh, this uh, stochastic element is mainly the imperfect knowledge of the researchers, not the imperfect knowledge of the, of the user. So this is why we have this stochastic uh, element. So what we're missing is, is, let's say, the evaluation of the transport options that we have, although we might not really use them. So, um, and then um, there are two concepts which I think um, can be explored, and one is option value, um, which um, has been mentioned also in, in, in the web tag. Uh, I've actually been, been, uh, been working also on the, on the guideline for that uh, in, in the web tag. Um, and used it in, so, in, some, in some studies, and there have been some studies looking at the option value, and so these are, these are the benefits that people sort of over and above the use value attach to, um, to keeping some option available for future use, which could be uh, having a public transport link or, or um, other means of transport. So you could say it's sort of an insurance premium to keep that option for future use, although you might not want to use it now or have not planned to use it in the near future. Um, 
and I think this, there is room to, to study uh, more how this is linked actually to, to, to accessibility, uh, which I have not yet done, but would be interesting to do so. Um, would I be willing to, to, to pay for, um, let's say, improving the metro in Paris? Um, I might not plan to go for a next ITF meeting in two years' time, but maybe I would, uh, will, willing, would be willing to pay um, for an improvement. Or, um, but is there a link with, let's say, uh, distance, or is there a link with distance decay? Um, would I attach a higher option value to options which are close by to those which are further away? It does make sense, but uh, there's no, let's say, uh, research at all uh, on that. And if you look at accessibility, of course, you would expect um, some decreasing yeah, marginal utility. Let's say the first shop is very important, but the 10th or the 100th shop is less important. Um, but it's also something which um, um, potentially could be interesting to, to include in, in, in appraisal, but uh, um, we don't do yet, and in the, um, in the web tag, this is more, I think, in a qualitative manner included. Um, Andres already um, um, hinted at motility, um, which I think is re also related to option value, although option value is more related to the economic valuation, I think, or can be used. So this capacity of, uh, of humans to be mobile and access is actually part of that, I think, is, uh, is quite interesting to, 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 to explore. Um, there have also been some empirical studies looking at um, motility or actually the access part of mobility. So um, if you give people more um, travel options, um, there was a paper in Switzerland which was looking at giving people a free public transport pass, which um, in increased their travel satisfaction and their well-being. Well so there's a link between having transport options and well-being and travel satisfaction, which I thought would be quite um, interesting. So I think there is sort of a, a theoretical um, potential link between motility, option values, and accessibility, but that has not been uh, studied um, uh, so far, um, which, which could be potentially, I think, uh, quite interesting. Um, well, I think the issue, let's say, if you look at the transport component, uh, well, value of time, comfort uh, has already been discussed in, in, in another uh, other, let's say, uh, ITF meeting, so I don't want to dwell on that. but. Um, not all travel time is it a disutility or a cost. Um, Andres also already talked about this, right? So I mean, if you if you work, can, are able to work in a train, um, that that travel time is not a total cost, but it's also there is also a positive utility to that. Um, there are um, let's say methods also, especially in the travel behavior literature, which are capable of capturing let's say those soft and, and hard variables uh, in hybrid choice models. But these are often, um, or I would say it's quite rare that they are used in accessibility studies. I know only two, two, two applications. Um, if you look at the individual components, well, I think uh, the link between accessibility, um, uh, satisfaction with travel and well-being, also Andres was, 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 uh, was talking about this. I, I do think this is something which is interesting to, uh, to explore. Um, might be that, um, I mean, we know that some studies looking at um, travel satisfaction or, or happiness, that, that longer commutes are related to lower levels of travel satisfaction and lower level of, of happiness, but depends on the mode of transport. So there was this, um, well, of course, it's a Dutch study, but um, looking at, let's say, increase in commuting times, walking or cycling, actually an increase in commuting time, if you cycle, can increase your, your happiness rather than decreasing, let's say, happiness. So it's not necessarily uh, always the case that um, a longer travel time is a lower um, level of happiness, which, of course, is not included at all in, in, in transport appraisal. Yeah, then there's also the temporal component of accessibility, which has been uh, heavily studied uh, in, in, uh, in the past, I think, 10 years with uh, navigation data and GTFS data. I mean, there's a whole, let's say, variety of uh, new data sources which uh, have been uh, used quite a bit um, in accessibility studies. Um, I have seen very little, let's say, uh, application or, let's say, yeah, in going into transport appraisal, whereas I think there is room to look at that. Um, we would, for example, would, would, uh, would look at uh, opening hours of public transport. I mean, before seven o'clock, there's hardly any transport. So if you rely, if you are, let's say, uh, a blue collar worker and you rely on public transport to get to some industry site or a distribution center, you, can sim you simply cannot get there. And appraisal, which are based on 
peak hour and off-peak hour travel time uh, measurements, I think, simply do not work. And there is much more detail and I think much more dynamics which can be included, um, also linking to the individual components of accessibility, which are hardly, I think, uh, used. Um, yeah, I, I do think we, we also need to look at uh, digitalization and accessibility. I mean, uh, the way we move, communicate, travel, workshop, and so on, socialize has, has changed uh, quite a bit. But the way we appraise our transport project has not really changed. Uh, so we're not really looking at that, I think. Also, the growing landscape of transport options into, let's say, app-based mobilities, uh, bike sharing, ride sharing, ride hailing, uh, and so on, and so on. I think this, this largely increases the landscape of transport options, which we so far have difficulty in, in including in accessibility models, and certainly also, I think, in, in, in appraisal. Um, yeah, that will be no problem. And, and interest, I think the, inf the, the impact of ICT is, is quite interesting because it affects actually all four components of accessibility. So it, boosts, it affects the land use component because it depends on the activity, um, the distribution of activities. Uh, it affects the transport components, but also the temporal and also the individual components. So actually, it's quite complex to, uh, to look into. But I think it's still really into its uh, infancy if you look at uh, the impact of dig or ICT or digitalization on, on accessibility. Well, I think I don't need to, to dwell on that, um, uh, on, on equity, uh, because it has been discussed uh, already. Um, uh, I think, yeah, if you, if you go beyond efficiency as the goal, but if you want to go for equity or for specific population groups, um, yeah, the, the uh, utility perspective does not really work. A value of, let's say, willingness to pay a concept does not really work because this is um, creating, you could say, uh, disadvantages for the low income groups. Um, going into appraisal, I think, I mean, the, um, the type of, of, of questions or uh, potential improvements in the valuation of accessibility that, that, that could um, improve the way how we appraise transport projects, uh, you could say mainly call for um, a transport appraisal which really caters for this multidisciplinary perspective on, on transport, not only, let's say, an economic perspective, but also sociology, like the motility concept. Um, uh, psychology and, and, and geography and other disciplines uh, as well. And I think this is easier to, to include in, in, in the multi criteria analysis. Essentially, the, the tag is sort of an unweighted multi criteria analysis, I think, um, than it is in a cost benefit analysis and try to really try to, to evaluate all this into, um, into one single measure. Um, the issue, of course, is that there are many different indicators that you, that, that you can include or not, and, and, and how actually do policymakers. Um, yeah, weigh the different uh, criteria. Um, well, you can also do a multi-actor, multi-criteria analysis, uh, creating uh, more challenges, I think. To conclude, I think um, accessibility research has, really has, has been really active, um, really flourishing, but I do not see, let's say, a lot of new theory or new empirical studies looking at valuation of accessibility. Um, existing tools which have been around already for decades are, are not well utilized. We're looking, for example, LUTI models. Um, also, yeah, even if you look at um, deriving benefits from spatial interaction models, the indicators which are there are, are hardly used. Uh, probably this, this has um, um, not only the technical, but also certainly, I think, institutional and organizational barriers which are also there and have come forward in studies on, on um, uh, why is accessibility not as a concept not not used in practice? So I think this case is probably similar. It also has to do with institutional and organizational barriers. Um, so I, I do think, uh, let's say, there's also a need to uh, do more research. But of course, I'm academic, so I wouldn't argue otherwise. Um, but also, I think for more theoretical and empirical research, specifically on the benefits of having choices rather than the benefits of traveling, which is the current, you could say, um, uh, paradigm. Um, related to travel satisfaction and well-being, probably um, digitalization is, I think, something that uh, that we need to work on. And I think also, um, yeah, probably we need to to think about yeah, multi criteria analysis related to uh, cost-benefit analysis. Thank you. Thank you.